legislation to improve the chances of survival in a disaster for USVI residents living with special needs and disabilities is headed to the Senate Committee on Rules and Judiciary. Bill 340265, which came up for debate in the Committee on Homeland Security, Justice and Public Safety on Monday afternoon, would amend Title 23, Chapter 10 of the Virgin Islands Code by adding a sub-chapter that establishes the Office of Disability Integration within the Virgin Islands Territorial Emergency Management Agency. This office would be responsible for equitable dissemination of information and other resources during disaster periods. This means that the Office of Disability Integration would ensure that there is equal access to disaster response and preparedness resources for people who are differently abled. These residents are currently marginalized because of the lack of expertise available to attend to their physical, psychosocial, and cognitive disabilities. During Monday's session, both senators and invited testifiers expressed concern that based on the needs outlined, the allocation of $125,000 to operationalize the office was just not enough. And those concerned included Acting Director of the Virgin Islands Territorial Emergency Management Agency, Barbara Peterson. I think it's budgeted at 125 and that's just for salaries and fringe. But I can't emphasize enough that that's a recipe for disaster. Um, do not underfund these positions and then it, it doesn't work. We need the resources. We talk about ASL interpreters. We talk about the basic things that people forget about. We will need, uh, we will need vehicles to transport people who have special needs. We will need certain equipment like computers that, that require certain TTX for communication that way. Um, cell phones. There's a whole lot of things that we will require. So you please make sure that we budget accordingly for the success of it. We don't want to set ourselves up for failure. Peterson also disclosed that disability integration was one of the 19 focus area initiatives identified at the beginning of the year by VITIMA, the Office of the ADA Coordinator, the Department of Homeland Security, Government House Joint Information Center, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Already, the ADA team has implemented Rapid SOS, an emergency response data platform that securely links data to 911 and first responders to locate people who reach out for help. In January 2023, text to 911, the ability to send a text message to reach 911 emergency call operators from your mobile phone or device will also come online. Once established, the Office of Disability Integration will immediately begin to address a number of already identified shortcomings with the current hurricane planning strategy and will work to remedy them, including increasing outreach to residents with mobility disabilities to register with VI TRAN ahead of hurricane season for transportation to and from shelters. They will also improve delivery options for people with limited mobility and mitigating challenges in getting in them getting to points of distribution and getting those commodities back home. The office will also ensure individuals in shelters, especially those who are deaf, have communication access to notifications being made to those in the shelter. The office will also secure American Sign Language interpreters for all public-facing activities in preparation and response, whether via social media or public broadcasting. ADA coordinator Julian Henley noted that finding and hiring people with expertise in this area was likely to present a challenge for some time to come. We're working with VRI services right now for VIPD because if they arrested a person and they needed to communicate, how do they do that? And so right now, those are programs that I'm working with throughout the territory to make sure that we have different ways of communicating to the vulnerable population in formats that meets each disability. And ASL just happens to be the one that really is on the top. Uh, even for requests to, um, from Vitima to um, through FEMA, when they're responding, we are asking them to always work with ASL interpreters so we can make sure that every time the director, assistant director, the governor goes to the public, that they're talking also with having an ASL interpreter. In addition, the Office of Disability Integration is expected to establish a database to keep track of the number of disabled people living in the territory. As Henley noted, that, cap that capability currently does not exist. Right now, we have done a, a 
putting together even to find out the number of persons within the government who have disabilities. And because it's, you don't have to disclose that you have a disability, a lot of times it's challenging. We put together this whole database at Department of Personnel. And for each person that's hired, or even person that's working within the government, to state, I have a disability and this is what my disability is. I have a disability, I don't want to disclose what it is, or I don't have a disability. And trying to get that data put together, it's almost impossible because we don't ask name, we don't ask any of that information. Henley said that studies conducted by his office show that most floodplain areas have a high number of residents who are seniors and people with disabilities. According to Henley, these vulnerable groups currently have no coordinated way of knowing and learning best practices during a disaster. Having this body put together with the ADA coordinator actually makes it even stronger because we would then not only look at first response uh, that the fire department might do, but what are they missing? Are they asking if, uh, if accommodations is needed? How do they go about knowing that they're going to a house with a person in a power wheelchair and need that One type minute. of uh, mechanism to get them out of their homes? So it's important for us to look at it from those angles. Henley also addressed the need to formalize a program that would allow the disabled population to receive sustainable power generation during future disasters, a move which could save lives. I know that Red Cross did uh, outreach in that area. That's not something that uh, that you, that I would say is it's not a concern, but we would have to look at resources and uh, grants or things that might be able to come together because there's persons who actually, after 2017, who actually died in their power chair Correct. because they couldn't move around the chair Correct. went dead and they, could, they were stuck in the middle of the floor. So there's a lot of concerns. I know that they did some small generators for persons with respiratory challenges and mobility devices like wheelchairs to be able to charge them. Um, but once again, they need assistance to start the generators and do other things. The draft legislation was proposed by Senators Marvin Blyden, Genevieve Whitaker, and Angel Balkes, but was actually the brainchild of former Senator Alison de Gazon. Senator Blyden noted that the final bill is a result of nearly two years of collaboration with various government agencies and social organizations. If it passes all upcoming Senate hurdles and is signed into law by the governor, the draft bill is, design, is designed to be implemented within 30 days. The integration is anticipated to happen in 90 days, provided, of course, that the manpower required can be hired within that time frame.